of my mask before, I'm so used to wear it. <laughs> and let's go on with the third panel. On the day, let me welcome here on stage Mr. Roberto Cingolani, Minister for Ecological Transition of Italy, and Mr. Daniel Wiener, President of the Global Infrastructure Basel Foundation. In the meantime, let me also welcome Mr. Makdar Diop, Managing Director and Vice President of the IFC, who has joined us virtually. Here you are. Very welcome to all of you. Minister Cingolani, let me start from you. How do we reconcile the need for economic growth with the transition to a carbon neutral economy? Can sustainable and quality infrastructure investments make the difference and which is the role for the G20 in this setting? Yeah, first of all, thank you for inviting. Um, I think as usual when you talk about sustainability, um, the key issue is that you should find a balance between different instances. The first one is obviously uh, taking care of the environment, especially for the future, and second one, taking care of social justice. And, well, as usual, this is a very difficult balance to find. Of course, infrastructures are playing a, a major role. Imagine the energy transition, that means uh, swapping from uh, fossil fuel-based uh, primary energy production into any renewable, whatever it is. Imagine empowering uh, serious uh, circular economy infrastructures. Uh, imagine restoring uh, proper environmental uh, quality of land, oceans and green for carbon trapping. I mean, these are gigantic investments, multi-year investments. There's no public can do, can do this on its own and no private as well. So you need very strong public-private partnerships and you need a plan. You need where you want to go. Um, of course, Europe, in, in our case, is, is setting up some, some uh, challenge. Uh, well, we have the Paris Agreement, but of course, local cir circumstances are very different from country to country and there is no unified recipe. So what is good for us may be a nonsense for another country. So you need a very deep understanding of the problem. Um, there's a third level uh, that I would like to point out in front of this audience. Um, clearly, if you see the G7 and the G20, uh, there are differences. I'm, I'm myself fresh of the presidency of the G20, environment and energy. Okay, I've seen differences, but honestly, those are not so large to justify a different roadmap. Ultimately, we will find an agreement so that the G20 countries will convey on a, on a, on a single solution. But those are 4.8 billion people producing 80% roughly of the carbon dioxide. I have a question. What about the other 3 billion people producing 20% of the carbon dioxide, of which 1 billion has no access to free energy and all the others have no uh, clean fuel to cook. So they, they suffer by in-house pollution rather than outside pollution. So you see, even the, even the concept, the definition of ecological transition in that case is completely different from what we believe should be the transition. So this is a major problem, maybe the largest. And I think uh, it, it is there where the international funds, uh, public and private collaborations, international aid, should diminish the gap. If we don't diminish the gap, it is pretty much like living in a house where everything is almost perfect, but maybe in one bedroom there is a fire. Mr. Diop, Diop, can you hear us? I hope yes. The International Finance Corporation plays a crucial global role in engaging with the private sector to ending extreme poverty and achieving the sustainable developing goals. Sustainable and quality infrastructure is part of the answer. However, the global infrastructure investment gap is widening at global level. How does the IFC leverage its position to tackle this need for new investments, especially in developing countries? And which could be the synergies with the G20? We will, uh, we will put on the... Okay. Hello. I, can I, you hear us? <laughs> Mr. Diop, can you hear us? Okay, we will put it better than that and then we come Apologize back to you. Uh, 
Do you mind, Mr. Wiener, if I come to you? <laughs> no problem, no. The Global Infrastructure Basel Foundation, Mr. Wiener, has been in the forefront of the efforts to classify and rank infrastructure on its sustainability, with the aim of fostering investment in such an asset. Which actions do you believe are necessary at the G20 level to avoid greenwashing and make sustainable infrastructure a real, tradable, liquid asset class? Yeah, thank you for this question. Of course, um, there's so many people in this room who can help to answer that question. We had a lot of insight already today about the question. So I would like to focus maybe, maybe for now on two points, which uh, we can maybe discuss further later on. So I'm, I'm quite tempted to start with the title of this, um, of this conference, Financing Infrastructure for the Recovery. It's a very interesting title. And one point that is... Um, interesting about it is that it doesn't qualify infrastructure. It doesn't say, and I'm not biting the hand that feeds me, um, but I'm trying to, uh, to be productive and say, why doesn't it say financing sustainable and resilient infrastructure for recovery? I think when we have achieved that step that it becomes clear that there, is, there are different kinds of infrastructure, the, the ones that help us to, to solve the problems, which are sustainable and resilient, and the ones that go in the wrong direction, which we still have a lot in, in our accounts and, and sometimes even build new. I think it's important for now, until it becomes ubiquitous, to stress that infrastructure has to be sustainable and resilient in the title. And the, the beauty of that is that we wouldn't need the, the, the sentence for the recovery if we had sustainable and resilient infrastructure, looking back, because sustainable and resilient means especially resilient, means that it, you don't need recovery. You are, or you recover very fast. It doesn't become an issue because, the, as the word says, resilience against crisis, against pandemics, against financial crisis, against environmental crisis, is built into the design of our infrastructure. And I think this is a very important point also for the financial sector. It shows that if we wouldn't have to spend so much money on, re on the recovery, but we could focus on the future, on the issues that the Minister uh, Cingolani mentioned, then we would be better off. And if we had resilient infrastructure, we would be better off. So that means for the, for the banks, for investors, for the public sector, resilience has a commercial value for the people, for the, for the banks, for investors, and therefore it's worthwhile to look at it. It's not just an additional cost. And that's my second point. Um, sustainability and re resilience still has uh, the notion that it's an additional cost. Okay, um, policy wants that, so we do it. Unfortunately, it will be um, bad for our returns and so on. This is something I hear every day. It has not been mentioned uh, today uh, yet, but um, this is the reality. And if we start to think long term, and we are part of the Long Term Investors Club, and if we see the value in, in the case of crisis, of, of the investment into sustainability and resilience, we, can, we find, and we also can prove that scientifically, that um, investing in resilience and sustainability is not actually an additional cost. It creates additional returns. It means it has a long-term value for the infrastructure. And therefore, I would really advocate everybody to uh, look at that equation. And if we look at it seriously, we really can create a sustainability and a sustainable and resilient asset class of in infrastructure because it becomes more predictable. What is an asset class? It is, it's a group of investments that has a predictable return. And the more resilient and the more sustainable infrastructure is, the more predictable return it will be because the volatility in case of a crisis, for instance, or of a, of a price raise or all the things that can happen to us um, is uh, taken away or is mitigated at least. It's, it's uh, the volatility is flattened out so far. I could go on, but I, we I, I, I we will take it on. from there. <laughs> Coming back to you, Mr. Cingolani, the EU has approved and is now starting the implementation of the next generation EU plan. Which is this plan's potential for the EU climate neutrality and which is the amount of resources needed in infrastructure for a successful transition? How can 
long-term investors such as D20 LTIC members and the private sector play a positive proactive role and be, me, be more involved in financing the sustainable and green transition in a way that also makes economic sense for them. Yeah. Uh, you already answered a bit, Mr. Biller, yeah. but we will hear the answer Just of Mr. Cingolani. A little bit. Yeah, I, I believe that the well, the problem is gigantic, and but also the investment is gigantic. I mean, we're talking about 1.7 trillions in Europe, more than two trillions in US. But those numbers have to be projected on a five-year scale with with about one billion people. So, uh, if you think uh, with a GDP of 1,600 uh, billions, Italy, uh, this is an extra input of approximately 40 billions every year. So, if you see in this respect, this is just a relatively small number. This means that it has to be considered as a powerful leverage to attract funds. Uh, if you have a, a yearly income in your family of 16,000 euro and somebody comes and gives you 400 euro and say, okay, with this 400, you have to renew the garden, renew the TV, renew the car, change the insulation of your house, you say, I cannot make it. <laughs> and this is the same, the same relationship in, in, in some sense. So clearly this is a fantastic leverage. So we have a clear target where to go. We have the technology, we have the governance to, to develop for, for the program. We have enough money to spark the activity, but the leverage should be high, maybe a factor of 10. Now, imagine um, installing 70 gigawatt is 70 billion watt of renew renewable power, uh, power plants in the next nine years. This is not public money. This will be bids, but the investors will come and invest. You have to prepare as a public the smart grid to manage the current flow on non-controllable sources because you're increasing the uh, discontinuous renewable energy uh, energy mix. Imagine installing new circular economy for uh, power uh, plants for differentiation of the waste, plastic, glass, whatever, organic, and transforming this into energy or recycled material. This is a lot of investment, but obviously, once you make the infrastructure, then the private and the society has to move around this infrastructure to develop. Uh, I, I can make a long list, actually. Uh, it could be the same in the digital, it could be the same in the health. So this is actually what we need, a spark, well done, so that you can attract investments and you can develop strong infrastructures. Right now, the, the most advanced countries are those who invested in due time on the infrastructures. So we should not miss this opportunity now. Can I add something? Because yes. it's, it's so nice you to, can hear, add, and then to, I will, to hear three I will, ministers I have question for of you, Italy Mr. speak so clearly about the future of sustainability and also the productivity of the idea of sustainability. And one person, not, fr not the minister, talked also about the debt crisis. Uh, which uh, is attached, so to speak, attached to th these kind of investments. And I think what you just said, Minister, about the, about the, um, the productivity of these investments and the leverage that they can have, if, if the collaboration between uh, public and private sector works well, it means, and I speak as an economist now, there's no debt crisis because it adds value to the economy, it makes people more productive, it allows for jobs to be created, it allows for uh, the health costs going down because um, the environment is going to be less polluted and all of that is productive and if you are, have debt that goes into a productive cycle, it means that you will be able to pay it back. So there's no debt crisis if the money is spent productively and it's, I think it's very important to say that here because some people think uh, too much debt is unhealthy Yes, it can be if you spend it to go to the movies, you know, but if you spend it on your house, it's okay. Mr. Wiener, I would like to ask you, how do you see your role evolving in between the need to reach a carbon neutral economy and the implementation of recovery plans worldwide, such as the next generation EU in Europe, uh, we were talking a few minutes ago, which actions should be taken by countries to achieve long-term quality infrastructure plans with clear targets in terms of climate resilience, greenhouse gas reductions, and social inclusion. I really like to hear on this point. Also about, yeah. Yeah, so I, could, I, I can answer this in two ways. One way is a, a little bit uh, like a commercial. 
for the SURE standard, which the Global Infrastructure Basel Foundation issues, because it really includes also the social aspect, the governance aspect, and the environmental aspect. And it's a, a tool that is easily applied uh, for the design of infrastructure in a sustainable and resilient way. And it has been developed with a, with a big group of stakeholders, so it is really representative, and it's also accepted as a good standard by many um, investors and also banks and multilateral banks who have uh, uh, applied it. So it's it's called sure standard. But then I'm finished with the commercial. It's very expensive. The, the airtime is expensive. So um, 30 sure means sure S U for sustainable and R E for resilient. So the sure standard is some uh, possibility for everybody to apply. But I want to to go beyond that and and especially also because I cannot touch about upon all the criteria but what I think is important um, is that we understand that the financial sector has a responsibility together with the governments not only to look at projects and then invest in this project because it's good and not invest in that project which is not good because everybody is complaining about the lack of pipelines although we have a lot of projects there is a lack of pipelines. Why is it so? Because the projects that come to the banks, the projects that come to the to the investors in general, they don't meet exactly their criteria, also not the sustainability criteria that they are all over. So my friend um, Francois Berger just told me there from the uh, long-term investors club, um, um, from the long-term investors association, uh, where is the secretary general? He said, just said to me there are 180 uh, standards around in, in, the, in the world and it will be not so quickly that we can merge them into one generally accepted uh, standard as we have with uh, accounting standards for instance. It took us 50 years since, um, since World War II after, uh, in order to create joint, uh, accounting standards that are generally accepted and it will, with sustainability and resilience uh, standards it will be the same. So everybody has their own ideas of what it is. And that means that when I come as a project developer or as a government, I come to a bank, it's just like a lottery whether it fits the criteria of the, this bank or, or, or not. And therefore, I advocate very much the dialogue, the very early dialogue between governments or respectively project developers, engineers, uh, developing uh, firms, and the financial sector. So I think the financial sector should engage with a with a very intensive dialogue early on with project development developers and gov gov uh, governments and convey the ideas what 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 makes a project bankable for us specifically and maybe there are three banks that work on a project and they even compete to get it done because it, it becomes better and better while you have that dialogue and at the end of the day um, you have a good project and it will, it's going to be bankable. And, and this is a very dramatic situation right now. 80 to 90 percent, we have not exact measures, but uh, uh, a globe, uh, according to the Global Infrastructure Hub, 80 to 90 percent of projects that are developed are never built because they don't have the quality that is needed for, it, for the investors. But what do we need so that this happens? And so two more sentences. We need to educate the investors. The investors need to engage in an in, in a educational uh, quest to understand what infrastructure, um, what, what infrastructure is actually and how, how it works. And with, with that um, learning exercise, there will be successful investors and also be able to leverage uh, the public money that comes in. So thank you. Thank you really very much, Mr. Cingolani, Mr. Wiener, for your very insightful interventions. We are trying to fix the, the line, let's say like that. I'm working in the radio, so for us it's always a line with Mr. Diop. We'll see what 